to go to Africa and see animals like these in the wild. Recently, Catalyst gave me the opportunity, and later in the show, I'll be showing you some very strange diseases in Kenya. We'll also be going behind the scenes here at Taronga Zoo to see some extraordinary creatures and the wonderful conservation efforts that they're putting in here. But first, here's Graham in San Diego Zoo with some very secretive elephants. San Diego, in the very south of California. It's one of America's nicest spots. Lovely climate, beautiful beaches, and an awful lot of wildlife. This city seems like Animal Central. They've got sea lions swimming at their beaches. They've got the famous San Diego Zoo, of course. But they've also got another wild animal park, and that's where we're going to today. Officially, it's the zoo's northern campus. A little kitsch, maybe. A touch of Africa in America. But it does have a remarkable collection of African animals. Lately, scientists have been paying attention to these guys. The park has a large group of African elephants, including three adorable young ones. Amanti is just six months old. They quickly work out there's a new person here. They're intrigued, but by the flared ears, slightly concerned about me too. We're OK. I'm from Australia. Pleased to meet you. For the elephant's sake, no touchings allowed. Plus, one of those trunks could grab you. Hi, Andula. So, what's she doing? Having She's just smelling snack? to see if uh, I have any goodies. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, she no. hears my voice. She knows me. I've no food food here. here. Sorry. But she just I'd sound? hand it over if I had it. Like us, elephants are highly social and very intelligent and always trying to outsmart each other for food. He'll take a flick and just tuck it right into his tusk. Yeah. And he goes, now can I steal someone else's while I've got this one? <laughs> so they're all thinking all the time. Very clever animal. Yeah. So you wonder, like us, do they have complex communications? To find out, the researchers hung technology around their necks. This is the collar that they were wearing. It is. Yes. Big necks they've got. They, they are indeed. So we had to have them specially manufactured so we would fit our elephants and they're yeah. all individual to each elephant. There's a microphone in the collar. That records audio, any of the calls or vocalizations emitted from any of the elephants 24 hours a day. So as they go about their business, every sound can be recorded and scoured for signs of communication. And something remarkable was found. The top window here, the blue that you see, is how volume or loudness changes over the time. And then the bottom screen shows us how frequency or pitch changes over time. Where does human hearing cut out? So it cuts out around about here, about 20 hertz for a young person. Surprisingly, below the level of human hearing is where much of the elephant talk is going on. This is the sound we've associated with elephants over the years, the trumpet call. Now, that one is all in our hearing range, but they also make this call. And you and I are only hearing the very tip of it. So what we're hearing here is the rumble call, and we actually are hearing about a third of the information. So it really is like there's a secret language there's going on there. We know nothing about it. Absolutely. There's a whole bunch more information than we originally thought. You can hear the hidden frequencies by fast-forwarding the sounds. This raises low frequencies to higher frequencies, which we can hear. So, this becomes this. To get an idea of what the sounds might mean, the elephants are fitted with GPSs. The reason a GPS is built into the collars is it tells the researchers where each elephant is compared to the other elephants. So they know, for example, if the two of them are down by the rocks having a chat about something. They learned something very interesting about pregnant mums like Litsemba. One of the most exciting things we've discovered recently is mums-to-be. Just before she's expecting, she has a special kind of rumble call, which changes within that low-frequency boundary that we can't hear, but they can, to announce to the rest of the herd that the baby's coming. And what we've seen as a result of that is the rest of the herd form this ring uh, between them all facing outwards, and we think that this is, uh, it has evolved in the past as an anti-predatorial situation. Now, 
there's still a lot more translating to do. But the secret sounds of elephants could give fantastic insights into what these guys chat about. They're possibly talking about us right now. Well, aren't they? you never can tell. <laughs> Graham trumpeting some research from San Diego Zoo. Well, we have world-class zoos here in Australia, and they do world-class science. This is Dr. Rebecca Spindler, and you are head of research and conservation here at Taronga Zoo. What sort of things go on behind the scenes here? At the moment, our marine biologist is heading down to Antarctica to work with UNSW and study the leopard seal diet, habitat preferences, and biology, so that we understand a little bit more about the species biology, but hoping that it can also tell us a little bit about climate change. Change. Our behavioural biologists are really interested at the moment in the interactions in our elephant herd. We've added one, two and obviously now three calves to our elephant herd and it's really interesting to see the interactions between the females and the calves. The females are all very protective of all of the calves but what's really interesting is who feels they can discipline each of the calves. They're telling us a lot about the hierarchy of the troop and how they're developing. This is a completely unrelated herd of elephants and the fact that they're acting just as they would in the wild is something that's been really, really fascinating. To watch. When I was a kid, I used to watch David Attenborough follow the London Zoo all around the world collecting animals, but you guys don't go into the wild anymore, do you? No, uh, we don't want to and we're not allowed to. So most of our breeding programs are actually managed worldwide, so a lot of our animals come from zoos around the world, but we also have animals that are washed up on beaches or they're recovered from being injured or diseased. We rehabilitate them. If they can't be released, they come into our collection. Conservation's about saving habitats, but you guys focus on species. How does taking an endangered species into intensive care fit into the overall conservation strategy? The traditional view of zoo conservation is breeding species and putting them out in the wild. And there's certainly a lot of great breeding programs that we're very proud of. But we also engage in a lot of education programs and habitat preservation and protection, both here in Australia and around the world. Education is incredibly important. For a start, we have 1.6 million people that walk through our doors. But we're also working with people on a more intimate basis. We have 120,000 people that go through a very intensive education program here at the zoo where they learn what they can do, what the primary threats are to wildlife. Our mission, our vision, is to create a shared future for wildlife and people. We take that very seriously because we know that without a healthy, thriving, natural world, we simply won't be here. Thanks, Rebecca. Habitat destruction can come back to bite us. It's a key factor in the way that diseases can jump from animals into humans. Recently, I was in Kenya following a dedicated bunch of researchers on the hunt for new diseases. Africa, the crack.